Special Ops is a new Wargame magazine. This is the first issue and it is published by MMP and it deals pretty much entirely with MMP games. There are articles about their games, there are uh, scenarios for Advanced Squad Leader and Advanced Squad Leader Starter Kit and the game that comes with the magazine, Raffia, is inspired by the standard combat series by MMP. There are differences between what you find in Raffia and other standard combat system games but the idea definitely is that one. That is the main point of reference. Raffia covers the battle of the same by the same name and the battle that was fought in 3rd century BC between the Egyptian army and the Seleucid army. The key word about this game, what really got me intrigued, is elephants because I really like elephants for me, that's a big plus when elephants are around, fun stuff is bound to happen. Um, this magazine actually comes also with another game, which is unusual for wargame magazines. The other game is called Savage Streets, it's about the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, it is a, a game where one side has hidden units and the other one doesn't, so I think it may work very well as a solitaire. You give the hidden unit side to the AI and the AI will be able to surprise you, but I have not played that game yet. I have played Raffia, so I'm going to tell a little bit more about this game today. Elephants. This is the map printed on paper. Clearly it is very functional. I mean it is almost empty, so it is very yeah, easy to understand where everything is. Um, most important hexes are this hex here and this hex there, that hex there. Those represent the tens of the two sides. The first player to move a phalanx unit into the home tent of the opponent is the winner of the game. Here you have two turn tracks, one for each side with a reminder of what the different phases in a turn are, some other reminders here and there. Other important features on the map are these two lines here. These are the setup lines. Players will set up their units on or behind those lines. There's only one scenario, but you can set up your units anywhere on or behind those lines. That means that from game to game you can try different setups and different experiments. A turn starts with the movement phase during which the active player can move any and all of his units up to the movement allowance of each unit. Movement allowance is that number there at the bottom center of each unit. Spending movement points in this game is very simple because all hexes on the map cost only one movement point to enter, so there's no terrain that will slow you down per se. However, units do project zones of control in the six axes surrounding them. And actually in this game you have two types of zones of control. You have the sticky zones and the lock zones. Sticky zones of control were pretty much like zones of control in many other games. A unit entering an enemy sticky zone of control must stop movement immediately. It can resume movement later, but the first hex that it enters must not be a zone of control. But then you also have the lock zone of control, which is the zone of control which is exerted by phalanx unit adjacent to other phalanx units. When you have such a situation, a lock is created and those units cannot move anymore. They're stuck together until all locking phalanx units on one side are eliminated. Several types of combat take place during the movement phase. One such type of combat is melee, which occurs when a unit physically enters the hex containing an enemy unit. To resolve melee, they really die for each side and you add the morale of the opponent, or in case of a stack, the worst morale of the opponent. Morale is this number here printed at the bottom left corner of the counter, and this is one of those games where a low number in morale means high morale in your troops, because a morale check is passed by rolling your morale number or more, so a low number gives you better chances of passing a morale check. Also, if you have more steps in the fight than your opponent, you get a plus one. This unit has two steps, as indicated by that number there. This unit has only one. So in this case, this unit also gets a plus one. And so in melee will receive a total of plus five, and this other unit will receive a total of plus three. You roll the dice, you compare the results, and the player with the greater modified roll is the winner. The loser will lose a step and retreat his full movement allowance toward his home tent. 
Cavalry units and elephant units can also trample their enemies during the movement phase. In order to do so, the moving unit must move into the X containing the enemy that is being trampled. The target of the attack takes a morale check, so the target must roll that number or higher in order to pass. If the target unit fails the check, it loses a step and it retreats by its full movement allowance towards its home tent. What happens next depends on the type of unit that is trampling the enemy. A cavalry unit also must take a morale check in case it fails, it loses a step, otherwise nothing happens. And a trampling unit, after trampling the enemy, will panic. And what that means, we will see in a minute. And some units, such as the phalanxes, also have the power to force an enemy retreat during movement. To do so, a unit with such power simply moves adjacent to an enemy unit, then announces the intention to enter the attacks, it does so, and the opponent must move the retreating unit by one, two, three axes away. And not after trampling, not after melee, but after a retreat of this type, the unit that forced a retreat can keep moving and can spend its remaining movement points. Once all movement and combat related to movement have been resolved, you have the ranged combat phase. Ranged combat is that value printed there in the middle of the counter, four here, six, five, that number indicates both the distance that the unit can fire at and the chances that that unit has to hit an enemy depending on the distance itself. For example, a unit with a 5 in ranged combat can fire up to 2 hexes away. It will hit by rolling a 5 or 6 on a 1d6 when firing at an enemy in an adjacent hex or will hit with a 6 uh, when firing at a unit 2 hexes away. A unit with a 4 can fire up to 3 hexes away, but as you can see the chances of hitting the enemy decrease with the increasing of the distance. A unit with a 6 in range combat can only fire at units adjacent to it and hit them only with a 6, not the most powerful archers around, definitely. But not all units will be able to use all types of combat against all units. You will refer to this table that will tell you how units interact with one another. For example, infantry can use range combat against a phalanx, only range combat, nothing else. You cannot in uh, start melee with them, it's not a good idea if you're infantry. But infantry can attack other infantry with melee. Infantry can force enemy missile units and cavalry to retreat, which is good, but it means also that infantry can never inflict any hits on enemy missile units and cavalry. These guys are just too fast, they keep running away. Infantry can use range combat against elephants, and well, let me show you another example. Cavalry has no effect whatsoever against phalanx, can engage infantry melee, can trample missile units. Actually, if you have an enemy missile unit, you cannot send the infantry against them. You have to send the cavalry, unless you send the infantry and you push them towards the cavalry. Hmm, so you see interesting combos start emerging. Cavalry can use melee against other cavalry and has no effect whatsoever on the elephants. After range combat, it's time to see what the panicked elephants on the map are going to do. For each panicked elephant, you roll 1d6, that will tell you the direction in which the panicked elephant will start running. For example, with a 5, it will start running in this direction. The panicked elephant moves in a straight line, moves with a movement allowance or A of 8, and it just tramples anything and everything that encounters on its way. Not very subtle way of moving. And it may trample your own units, a mix of units belonging to you or to the opponent, but in some cases a panic elephant in the right location can really do a lot of damage and destroy a huge number of enemy units or is to trample them. Uh, with one exception, the uh, trampling and running will end if a panic elephant hits a phalanx. In that case, the panicked elephant kills a step of the phalanx and then dies. 
And while all this was going on, the phalanx units locked with other phalanx units kept pushing and pushing and pushing against one another because there really isn't much else that they can do. After the elephants are done with the little show, you will resolve the pushing that phalanx units are doing against one another. The active player will assign steps from the phalanx units that are locked with enemy phalanx units and will assign steps to push against enemy hexes. Then the active player will roll on a table. The result will be influenced by the number of steps that are pushing against a certain X and by the number of enemy steps that are in the X that is being pushed. Depending on the result, some Xs may receive a pressure marker uh, that may have different levels of pressure and some Xs may just receive no marker because there isn't enough pressure to really make a difference. Suppose that you roll, for example, and this, mark, this X here receives a pressure 3, this other X a 1, this one nothing, this one receives 4. Then once you're done assigning pressure markers, you go back and you roll a die for each unit which is under a pressure marker. If you roll that number on the pressure marker or less, the corresponding unit loses a step. I have to say that this is a game that I enjoyed. I found it to be a very nice game. I like the flow and the pace of the game overall. Maybe the first turn or two in a game are a little long or they feel long just because there are many units on the map. It takes a little bit before everybody moved and everybody performed their attacks. But after a couple of turns when the slaughter is on its way, trust me that um, you will have less units on the map to maneuver and things will go much faster. Also the first couple of turns maybe you will be referring to the combat chart more often that you'd like to just because you need to double check which units can perform what against which other units but after a while that becomes natural especially once you realize how you can think about it thematically you can just think yeah infantry really shouldn't be able to do this and that against cavalry oh yeah feelings you know can, they could do this but clearly they could not do such and such so if you think about it thematically not only is it easier to play the game but also you realize how the combat chart really captures a good range of strengths and weaknesses that certain units units will have in certain circumstances. I like that. I like the situational weaknesses and strengths of the units. No one is hopeless. No one is all-powerful. It all depends on how you use your units. Overall, a fun game that I'll be able, I'll, I'll be glad to play again and I'll be able to do so thanks to the different setups that I can try. It comes with another game, Saver Streets, that I'm very optimistic about. It comes with a magazine that, if you're an MMP Games fan, is an absolute must. So I would say, with this package here, it's hard to go wrong.